about this and a bunch of other people I was talking to were also confused about it, or this is a question that I think probably everyone might like to hear the answer to. Um, any questions like that? Or just any mm -hmm. you know questions about something I said last time that you were unclear on? Multi-way, what does that mean? Oh, like the multi-way, uh, like multiplexers and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Mux four way sixteen, right? Um, so, uh, let me think about what to say about that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so the 16, of course, is referring to the fact that there's just like 16 wires coming in. Um, let's see, wait, a MUX. I always, I honestly always get these confused. I mean, I did the projects. MUX is the one that's, you get two inputs and it's choosing, it's using the select line to choose which one you're going to send to the output, right? So, so in this case, you actually have 32 wires coming in, like one group of 16, another group of 16, and then you're getting 16 out, and you're just choosing which 16 to send. So that part is not, that's just like a lot of copy paste, right? You need like, you know, this wire, this wire either comes from this wire or this wire, and this wire either comes from this wire or this wire. Um, uh, but I guess, I guess the four-way, mm -hmm. right, exactly. So the fact that it's four-way means you actually have four groups of 16 wires coming in and you're choosing one of them right based on uh you now have two select lines coming in right and so two bits means you have four possibilities right zero 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 one one zero one one um so i guess my hint there would be uh think about Considering like those two select wires that are coming in, think about think of them one at a time, right? So like you know, just look at one of them and be like, okay, if this one is zero or if this one is one, what does that tell me about uh, you know which? It doesn't tell me exactly which group of wires to pick, um, but it tells me that it's going to be you know these two and not these two. Um, and so you already have built something that chooses between two things, between two possibilities. Right. Um, so, namely, uh, like a normal two way MUX. So, there's definitely a way to reuse the, you know, the MUX that you built, a two way MUX, to make a four way MUX. So, that's, and, and in general, with all of these, right, you always want to think about how do I use the pieces I've already built um, to make something slightly more complex, right? And it's definitely, um, it didn't just tell you, okay, just build an eight-way MUX. It says, okay, no, first build a two-way MUX, and there's a reason that it told you to do that. Um, so, I don't know, does that, I, I don't, maybe I don't want to give away more than that, but does that help, Daniel? Maybe. Okay. Any other questions about the project? Oh, someone has their hand up. Who's that? Uh, go ahead. Question. So um, once we've built using the NAND gates, once we've built like and, or, and not, can we start using mm -hmm. those in, the, in their notation instead of using NAND gates for everything? Yes, absolutely. No, and okay, you should, ahead. right? That's, that's, this is the point, um, right? Once you've used NAND to implement, say, uh, or, you can now use or anywhere you want. And conceptually, right, think about like, think about it like you put some NANDs together in a certain way, and then you could like package those up in a little box. And really on the inside, there's NANDs, right? But from the outside, you just have this box that functions like an or, and you don't have to think about the fact anymore that there's NANDs inside. And you can use those, you know, to build something else. So still fundamentally, everything is built from NAND, but you get to think at a at a higher level. Every time you make a new thing, you can now think at a higher level by using that instead of using NANDs directly. Yeah, because like <clears throat> I don't actually know. It'd be interesting to to 
once we actually finish building the entire CPU, it's like you know about halfway through the semester. If you kind of go back and calculate how many NANDs are actually in, you know, the entire CPU that you built, I mean, it's a lot, right? It's definitely thousands, um, if not tens of thousands. Like I, I don't know, actually know. And it would be ridiculous to sit there and try to write the whole thing in terms of NANDs, but that's we're not going to do that, right? That's the whole point. So, so yes, absolutely. Once you once you make a certain uh, chip, you can feel free to reuse that, and you should reuse that in the, the later chips that you're building. You can even do it out of order, right? If you're like, well, I don't quite understand how to make AND yet, but I know that how I would use AND to make this other thing. That's fine. Go ahead and use AND for that other thing, right? You can use that trick of just move the AND.hdl file out of the directory temporarily so that it'll use the built-in AND so you can test. And then you can go back later and, and fill in, you know, figure out how to do AND. But um, cool. Um, let's see. Is there another? Who else has their hand up? I can't. It's showing me there's a hand up, but it doesn't show me who it is. Uh, Kolya. Yeah. I, um, I had a question about Nanta Tetris. Oh, uh, does it? Does that work on Linux? It should. Yep. Um, I mean, I'm using Linux, and I I I did the whole thing. So, if you are having trouble, um, you know, definitely set up an appointment with me, or just send me a message. Um, you definitely have to make the .sh files executable. I think I sent out a little hint about that. Um, you can't run the tools before you make the things executable, so that might be one thing. Um, otherwise, if you're still having trouble, yeah, let me know, and we can we'll figure it out. Cool. Any other questions? OK, Daniel says you might need to install Java. Yeah, so definitely all the tools um, uh, are use Java. So if you don't have like Java SDK installed or something like that, um, that might be one issue. So some of you may already have that installed, but if you don't have that installed, then yeah, that'll be something you have to do. And if you are having trouble with that, I mean, so definitely feel free to like get help from each other or get help from me. Um, we'll, we'll get it figured out, all right? Cool. All right. So, so um, we talked about um, you know building these logic circuits do kind of logic things, and that's what project one is about. So today I want to talk about um, building circuits that do arithmetic. So that's basically project two, um, which we're going to start working on next. Um, and so I want to go through kind of how that works, because obviously computers can't don't just do logic. Um, somehow they use logic to do stuff with arithmetic numbers. <clears throat> so we'll do a quick refresher on binary. Um, I am assuming you should have seen binary and how binary works somewhere, like in you know 150 or data structures or um, discrete or somewhere. Um, I mean, if you really haven't, that's okay. I'll, I'll give a quick refresher and you'll just have to go, um, you know, get caught up and learn more about that on your own. That's fine. Um, but quick refresher. So let's see, I'm going to share my screen here. And where, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so can you all see this? look like a sheet of paper or something. Um, OK, cool. So uh, binary, I'm going to try this. This is uh, different than what I was using the last time, but this should be much easier to send to you later. Um, and I can actually write on my screen here. So, um, so binary, um, aka base 2. Right, so we have things like we use digits one and zero, and we when we write things like, you know, one zero one one zero, right? This is the the two to the zero place. This is the two to the one place. This is the two squared place, right? And so on. Two to the third, two to the fourth, um, and so this in base two, we can often write a little like subscript two if we want to emphasize that it's base two, right? This would be like so. This is uh, 2 plus, this is a 4, 
And then this one is in the uh, two to the fourth place, so that's 16, uh, which is uh, six plus is 22, base 10. Okay. Um, and then we also use um, we also often use hexadecimal, which is base 16, right? So hexadecimal, which is base 16. Um, so, and we use the digits zero through nine, and then A through F to represent, you know, zero up through 15. So, for example, you know, uh, A, C, seven, um, right, base 16. As well, this is the the seven is in the ones place, C is in the sixteen to the zero place. So this is let's see, C would be uh, nine, and then A is ten. B, I'll just write it over here, right? So you know, A is ten, B is eleven, C is twelve, D is thirteen. Oops. E is fourteen, and F is fifteen. So C would be twelve. So this is twelve times 16, and then A is 10, so that's 10 times, that's in the 16 squareds place, so that's 16 squared, which is something, and honestly, I don't want to do that in my head right now, but um, you could figure that out, what it is in base 10, right? <clears throat> and the reason, does anyone, well, I'll just say, maybe you remember this, maybe you don't. The reason we often use base 16 is that it is a convenient a shorthand for base two. So basically every hexadecimal digit corresponds to exactly four uh, bits. Okay, because 16 is two to the fourth. So for example, you know, A, it is 10 in base 10, but in, in binary, it's 1010, zero, zero, you know, base two. B is 1011, one, one, base two. Right, C is one one zero zero base two, and they all each hexadecimal digit corresponds to exactly four binary digits. So you can literally just like, if you take a hexadecimal number, so we could actually, you know, under the seven, I'll write uh, zero one 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 because that's what is seven is in binary, right? C is one one zero zero, and then A is one zero one zero, right? And that is exactly what Whatever that number is, that's what it is in binary. So we can easily convert back and forth. So it's much easier to read AC7 than it is to read like 10101100011. So we'll often use that as an as an abbreviation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> cool. Um, I'll try to flip back over to. I only have one screen, so I'll flip back to Teams occasionally to check and see if anyone has a question. You can put it in the chat or whatever, but. Um, you know, feel free to just unmute and interrupt me. That way, I'll I'll know for sure. I will I will uh, get the question for sure. Okay. So, any questions so far? So, hopefully, this is review. But um, I'm happy to answer questions. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's talk about. Let's see. Uh, I just. Let's talk about. Um, you know. Binary addition. So how does adding binary numbers work? I mean, it works actually very similarly to the way that, you know, adding base 10 numbers works. Um, so let's add, uh, you know, 0, 1, 0, 1, and uh, 0, 1, 1, 1. We'll add these. So these are two four-bit numbers in binary, and I'm going to add them. So one plus one is uh, is two, of course, but that's not. I can't write two because this is binary, right? So two, of course, in binary is one zero. So we put zero here, and we carry the one, right? Just like when you're adding in base ten, if you get something bigger than nine, you put down the tens digit, or the ones digit, and then you carry the tens digit. Okay, so this is because, uh, yep. Yeah. So now in this column, I have one plus zero plus one, which is again zero, and I carry a one. Okay, and then here I've actually got three ones, so that's three. Uh, in binary, that's one, one, so I put a one here and carry the one, and now I have one plus zero plus zero is one. Okay, 
Um, and you know, we can check, right? 101 in base 10, this is 1 uh, plus 4, that's 5. And this is uh, 7. And if I add 5 plus 7, I should get 12. Uh, and this is 8 plus 4, so indeed, that is 12. Um, so that works. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so what would happen, um, you know, let's say if I had some slightly, let's say I, I, I uh, have some slightly bigger numbers, 1101, and uh, let's see, uh, 0011. Okay, um, we can just do this quickly. This is zero carry the one, again zero carry the one, zero carry the one. Okay, so actually it's exactly zero carry the one. Um, however, so we run into to an issue here. We can run into an issue. Um, it depends on you know how many bits the computer that we are using uh, uses to represent numbers. So when you hear people talk about you know uh, oh this is a 64-bit system or an 8-bit system or whatever, really what that is talking about is, you know, how many bits does the computer use to represent numbers? Like how many bits can it do operations on at a time? Um, so historically, right, um, you know, in like the, um, you know, some of the original home computers that came out like Commodore 64, also thinking about gaming systems like the original Nintendo system, those were 8-bit systems, so they, um, you know, all the values that they pass around um, are 8 bits, um, and they can do, you know, operations on, you know, like, like they can add 8-bit values and things like that. Um, you know, then like around maybe the early 80s, like IBM PCs started coming out that were 16-bit machines, um, and that actually, what we're gonna, the the computer that we're going to build. Um, the virtual computer we're going to build is going to be a 16-bit machine, so we're going to be able to deal with 16-bit values. Um, then, like the late 80s, early 90s, you had 32-bit machines. Around maybe 2000, you started to get 64-bit machines. And these days, of course, um, as you as you may know, pretty much any computer that you buy these days um, is 64-bit. So um, it's actually kind of difficult these days to get something that's not 64-bit, unless it's like an embedded system or you know, something like that. But um, so the question is, what happens when you add some numbers and you get a number that's bigger than what the computer can represent? Um, and so in this example, like I, I'm imagining that um, that I, I have a computer that only can represent four bit numbers. And so in this case, I added these and I got something that was bigger than four bits. OK, so this is called overflow. So. Right, because we can't actually, in this computer, this kind of uh, ideal computer, we can't actually represent numbers that are that big. Um, and so we would get, like in this case, we would literally get the answer zero. And, um, but maybe there would be some something to signal the fact that it overflowed. Um, and we'll see the computer that we're gonna build, will be able to do this. Um, and we'll see how that gets used. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, right. And maybe I'll just actually just show you quickly. So uh, oh, let's make this big. So, and in in many programming languages that have kind of um, uh, okay, that's fine. In programming languages that have fixed size integers, so like Java has things like int and long, um, Haskell has like an int type. Um, Python's ints are not fixed size, um, but if they are, you can actually see this happening. So if I say like, um, uh, well, maybe, you know what, okay. Maybe I'll show that later. Yeah, well, we'll come back to this because we're going to talk about something else first that'll make it um, easier to understand what we're seeing. Um, but for sure, like if you're using Java and you you use an int, um, that's a 32-bit type. And uh, if you add 
some ints and you get something that would represent would, that would take more than 32 bits to represent, um, it's going to overflow and you're going to get something weird. You're going to get like a negative number or you'll get zero or something like that. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what exactly you would get. Um, but if you've ever seen that happen, this is why. Um, and like Python, for example, ints can be as large as you want, but Python is doing a lot of stuff to make that work. Like really, it's representing numbers as like arrays. Um, the computer, the underlying CPU, can't actually add numbers that are that big. Um, so Python is like giving it lots of addition problems to do and keeping arrays of things and, and like breaking it up into smaller pieces for the computer to do. Um, but that's all done at the level of the, the language, not like the, the computer itself cannot do arithmetic on numbers bigger than, say, 64 bits. <clears throat> all right. So, um, all right. So the question, the, the next question is, um, how do we represent negative numbers? Or how do we do subtraction? OK. Um, and let's see. I want to. So subtraction. And really, I want to talk about like how we're going to represent negative numbers. OK, so one obvious idea would be, OK, well, we've got, you know, let's say, uh, you know, a certain number of bits to represent a number. Let's just use one of those bits to tell us what the sign is, whether it's positive or negative, right? So first idea, right? Use the first bit as a sign bit. You know, so for example, um, so for example, you know, zero, one, zero, one, would be positive five and one one zero one would be negative five, right? Because the one zero one means five and the first bit is telling us whether it's positive or negative. So the zero means positive and one means negative, right? So this would be like, um, let's see. All right, this would be the sign bit. And this is like the, you know, the magnitude or something. Right. So 1101 one, one no longer means, uh, um, no longer means uh, 11. <clears throat> it now, like the first bit means it's negative and the, the rest tells us kind of how big it is. Um, so you can make this work. Um, but it turns out that uh, there's, there's a couple reasons that this is not a great way to do this. Um, one reason is, um, so I'll say, but, whoops, uh, but this doesn't work well. Right, and there's kind of two main reasons. So one reason is, um, what is, so if I write down one zero zero zero, what number does that represent? What do y'all think? Nine? Mm -hmm. Negative zero? Yeah, so I mean according to the the scheme that we just said, the first bit tells us the sign. So one means negative, and then the rest tell us how big it is, and we have zero, zero, zero. So I guess that's negative zero. Okay, but that's weird, right? Because now, what is negative zero? Like it should be the same as normal zero, but we now have two different ways to write zero, I guess. Um, so two different zeros. Okay, and that's bad for a number of reasons. I mean, one is just kind of weird, and two, 
if we actually want them to be the same, we now have to have a bunch of special cases because we have to make sure that no matter which zero we get, we treat them the same way, right? Um, and if we are going to be able to test whether two binary numbers are equal, we can't just say, are all the bits the same? They're equal, done. We have to say, oh, well, there's also a special case for if you know, there are two different kinds of zero, then they're, they're also equal. Um, that's weird. Um, the other thing is just it, it turns out that to, in order to make this work, we need lots of special cases. Like if we're going to add, we have to have a bunch of ifs that say, well, is this positive? Are they both positive? Is one negative? Are they both negative? And we need like different um, different circuits or different code to handle all those different cases. Um, so we need a lot of. And when I say ifs, right? I mean, of course, we're going to talk about building circuits to do this. So I'm not literally talking about like an if statement in a programming language. I might be talking about like, you know, a mux or something. Um, but the concept is the same. We need like more circuit or more program to decide what to do in different situations um, to handle you know, different situations. Okay. And you might think, well, that, that seems unavoidable. Like if you're going to have positives and negatives, you're going to have to have some ifs to decide you know, what to do. However, it turns out it is avoidable. So, um, all right, let's see. Um, so let's make a new page. <clears throat> okay. So there is a, a different way that we could represent negative numbers. Um, and it's a really, it's a super elegant idea. This is, um, I remember when I first learned about this in undergrad, like my mind was blown um, because it's such a beautiful idea and it, it works amazingly well. And you would not, it's something you wouldn't really, you might not think of it. Um, it's not an obvious idea, but once you see it, once you see how it works, um, it's great. So this is called two's complement. Arithmetic. Complement. Yeah. Okay. So here's the idea, right? So we've got numbers like, um, you know, let's say I've got, uh, you know, zero zero one one is three, and zero zero one zero is two, and zero 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 one is one, and zero 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 is zero. Right now, think about. Um, you know, think about this as like an odometer. Um, I don't know, maybe you don't even know, like odometers these days are all digital, right? But if you think about the kind of thing where like you've got little wheels that rotate with digits on them, you know, and every time the first wheel goes around to nine and then it, when it go, flips over zero, it like pulls the other one, you know, one place with it, right? So then that, the next one goes up by one um, and so on. But if you imagine if an odometer like that um, were to be counting down, and it went all the way down to zero. If it kept going down, what would you get next? Like, what would be the next thing that would happen if you went down past zero? Any anyone have an idea what would happen? And I'm just talking about like you know in a like in a car, if you have like the digits zero through nine on each wheel, if it kept going down past zero 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 zero, what would happen? Daniel's making some motions, but. All ones, okay. Yeah, so I, I think maybe, Cade, you're thinking about the, the binary thing. But yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so Morgan says we wrap back around to 999. Exactly, so both of those are exactly right. In base 10, in like in your car, if it keeps going down past zero, like they're all gonna flip over to nine. Um, you know, thinking about the other way, when you get to not all nines and then it keeps going up, they're all going to reset back to zero. Um, so that's the next thing that happened. And in binary, I think what this is what Cade was saying, um, that yeah, if we keep going down past zero, we get to, it would like they'd all flip over to ones. Um, so so if we keep going down, we would expect to get this. Um, and then if we kept going down past that, like you know, if we go down one more, we would get one 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 zero. And if we went down one more, we get one one zero one. Right. And so the idea is, you know, maybe this should be negative one. 
and maybe this should be negative two and negative three. Right, those are that's very different than the way we were representing thinking about representing negatives before, right? So, you know, before we were thinking negative one would be a one to tell us it's negative and then like zero, zero, one. But now we're saying, well, maybe negative one should be one, 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 one. Um, and uh, this turns out to work fantastically well. So, uh, so that is in fact what we're going to do. So, but let me convince you that it works well. Um, and I will also say, right, notice that the first bit, um, you know, so this, this first bit is still a sign bit. So this still tells us the sign, right, because all the positive numbers start with a zero and all the negative numbers are going to start with a one. Um, but it's the way that we interpret the rest of the digits that's different. So, um, you know, well, for positive numbers, it's the same. Right, but for negative numbers, apparently we're we're interpreting them somehow differently. Um, so let me let's see if I can convince you that this works. So, um, for example, let's try adding negative one plus one. So if we add negative one plus one, we ought to get zero, right? So if I say, um, let me put some examples over here. Um, if I say like, uh, so negative one is one 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 one. This is negative one, and then one is zero, 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 one. And I'm going to add these. So this is one. Uh, one plus one is zero, carry the one. Uh, one plus one is zero, carry the one. One plus one is zero, carry the one. One plus one is zero, carry the one. But that overflows, right? So we don't actually, that one is gone. And we, in fact, did get zero, right? Check. That's cool. Um, well, let's try something else. What if we do like negative one plus negative one? So one, 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 one. If I add these, so this is negative one and negative one. Um, well, one plus one is zero, carry the one. One plus one plus one is one, carry a one. Uh, again, one, carry a one. One, carry a one, which overflows, so that goes away. We have one, 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 zero. That's negative two. That's exactly what it should be, right? Check. Um, let's try one more thing. What if we do uh, two, so positive two, so zero, zero, one, zero, plus negative one, 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 one. So this is two, this is negative one. Uh, zero plus one is one. One plus one is zero, carry one. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1, 0, carry a 1, and we, in fact, get 1, exactly like we should. Okay, so the amazing thing here is that, um, like, we didn't need any kind of special case for adding negatives, right? We just use the normal addition algorithm, and it works for positives and negatives, um, right? We added two negatives, we got the right thing, we added, like, a positive and a negative, so the cool thing is this means we can actually do subtraction um, just using addition. So we don't actually need a special algorithm to do subtraction at all. Um, if we just make a circuit that does addition, that's all we need. Um, and that addition circuit, well, if we just like um, add a negative, that's be, that will be the same as subtracting. Uh, and it works in exactly the same way. So that's really cool. <clears throat> um, I should tell you like, how do we negate something though? So if I wanted to do three minus two, Right. Well, I need to somehow make I need to turn the two into a negative two so I can add it. Um, so how do we negate? And I don't actually know, but maybe if I thought harder, I could figure out a good way to kind of derive this. Um, but I'm just going to tell you and then we'll, we'll see that it works. And maybe I'll let you think about how you would kind of derive this in the first place if you if you had no idea. But um, so the answer is this, so negative x, so if I have something that's x and I want to negate it, right, I do not x, so that means like flipping all the bits, and then I add one, plus one, okay? So for example, right, if I have two, so like zero, zero, one, zero, when I negate it, I get uh, one, one, zero, one, and then when I add, so this is, uh, negate 
uh, I shouldn't say negate, I should say in uh, invert, right? Uh, and negate is, uh, neg you have to be careful using the word negate, especially in this context, because um, like we're talking about arithmetic negation, but sometimes people use the word negation to talk about flipping all the bits of something, um, which are very different things, right? Um, and then we're going to add one. So 1101 plus 1 is 1110. Okay, and yes, in fact, that is negative 2. So here it is over here. Um, and we could check going back the other way. Like, does it work both ways? So if I have 1110, I invert all the bits. I get 0001, and then I add 1, and I get 0010. So that works. It goes back and forth. Okay, and that's that's nice because these are both easy operations to do. So as long as we can, so what we need is we need a circuit that can do addition. We need to be able to flip all the bits in something and we need to be able to add one. Well, if we already can do addition, then we can add one, right? Basically, if we can do addition and we can do not, then that means we can do subtraction. That's all we need to do subtraction. Um, so that is very nice because that's going to mean there's not a lot of parts we have to build um, to be able to do that. Okay. Um, one thing I will mention, right, is that um, the uh, the one slightly weird thing about this is like one zero zero zero. Like, what happens if you negate that? Um, you know, negative. What's that? So I get uh, if I invert it, I get zero one one one, and when I add one to that, um, these all carry, and I get. One zero 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 again. So apparently, that is itself, which is a little weird. But really, what's going on here, right, is that, like for four bits, the range of values I can represent, I can represent. So this is negative eight. One zero 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 is negative eight, and I can go all the way up to positive seven. So um, let me hang on. So you know, one one zero zero zero. This is negative eight. And I can go all the way up to 0, 1, 1, 1, which is positive 7. So you can see that, like, you know, there's nothing that corresponds. If I negate 8, I get I would get positive 8, but I can't represent positive 8. It would If I add 1 to 7, it wraps around and goes back down to negative 8. So it kind of makes sense that negative 8, negating negative 8 gives itself, but it's a little weird. Um, but it's honestly way better than the problem with having, like, multiple zeros and stuff like that. Um, so, and I was, I'm going to show you now. So, if I open this up again. Um, so, this is Haskell, and it doesn't matter if you know Haskell or not. It, it works the same way in any language like Java or something that's got. So, if I say like 2 to the. So, in Haskell, ints are 64 bits, um, at least on my computer. So, if I say 2 to the 63rd. Um, as an int, right? It actually that's that's too big. It can't represent that, and so we're going to get negative two to the sixty third, right? So it overflowed. So negative two to the sixty third is that number, right? And if I negate that, if I say negative negative two to the sixty third, right? Uh, wait, what? Oh, 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 haha, <laughs> I have to say int. <laughs> it was using a, a integer, which is like an arbitrary size. Yeah, see, we get a negative again. It's that same thing about how 1000 negated went back to itself. Um, but, um, you know, but in general, if I say like 2 to the 61, uh, right, is big. And if I, if I say like that plus 2 to the 60, Yeah, but if I add another two to the sixty, at some point it's going to overflow, and I'm going to start getting a negative number. Um, uh, oh, maybe it overflowed so much that it was. Oh uh, no! I can't do this math in my head. Okay, uh, at some point we. Oh, I'm still not saying. Huh? That's why I'm. St I still need to say int. OK, yeah, so we get a negative number. At some point, if you make it big enough, you're going to get a negative. And kind of now you know why, right? Because if you just add 
Well, actually, let's um, if I go back here and if I say, you know, when I do like, uh, you know, six plus three, zero, zero, one, one, right? I get zero plus one. So this is six plus three. I get one. One plus one is zero carry the one, zero carry the one, one. So one, zero, zero, one. That's negative something, right? Because I got a because it, it was too big and now I get a one in that first place. Um, but that's just this is just what happens when we have a limited amount of bits to represent numbers. We're gonna we're gonna have things wrap around and stuff. You just have to be aware of this, right? So when you're writing a program um, that uses numbers, you do you have to be sure that the numbers you want to represent are not too big that they're gonna you know not fit in the number of bits that you have. Um, all right. Any questions? Let me stop for a minute and see if there's any questions. Zach. Um, so when we're uh... When we're inverting the number to to negate a number, we can mm -hmm. just flip the uh, like all the bits, including the sign bit, correct? Yep. Okay. okay. All the bits, including the sign bit, and then you add one. Right. Um, yep. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> cool. So uh, the upside of this, right, is that um, all we need, right? So, so to do addition, we can make a circuit to do addition, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And then, if we have, uh, you know, be able to invert stuff, which we already do, right? You, you all built a knot. You're building a knot, like a knot 16 in your uh, project. We could use that to do subtraction, right? And then, if we have some way to loop, um, we can do multiplication and division. In terms of addition and subtraction, so in fact, you know, all modern CPUs have actual circuits to do multiplication and division and to do it uh, pretty efficiently, um, but it's pretty complicated, um, and we're not going to do that. So if you if you are curious, you're certainly welcome to look up and see how like multiplication circuits work, but it's um, they're definitely pretty complicated, and we're not going to do that. So we're just going to build you know a circuit to do addition and then multiplication we're going to kind of implement at a higher level. So basically, we're going to have, we're, we're going to make much later in the semester, um, the operating system, the little kind of operating system we're going to make will provide a multiplication operation so that you can use multiplication in the programs that you write, but, mul but really that'll get translated into a loop that uses the addition circuit um, in the underlying computer. So from the point of view of writing a program, you actually can't tell whether the computer is literally doing your multiplication in hardware or whether it's, whether it's getting translated into some code. Um, but that's actually how it's going to work. But you know, but your actual computer that you have, your CPU, can literally do, you know, it has it has a circuit to do multiplication. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about how to do addition. So. Um, OK, so we're going to start with something called um, a half adder. And the goal is to add, whoops, add two uh, one bit numbers. OK, that's a pretty uh, modest goal. So we're going to make a little truth table here. So I'll call them uh, call them A and B, and you know put all the possibilities here. So zero zero one one zero one zero one. Okay. Um, and uh, so zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. One plus zero is one. Right, but one plus one is a little bit tricky because that's two. We definitely can't represent that with a single bit, right? So that corresponds to like if we're adding stuff, 
you know, in a column, this is the case where we would need to carry something. Um, so what that shows us is that this circuit actually needs two outputs. So this is another example of a circuit that has more than one output, right? Um, and so traditionally what we call that is we have the carry bit, right? Because it's the thing that you would carry to the next column if you're adding. Um, and then we'll have the sum, which is like the thing you would put at the bottom of the row, okay? So zero plus zero is zero and there's no carry, right? Zero plus one is one and there's no carry. One plus zero is one and there's no carry. And then one plus one, of course, is zero, but we carry a one. Okay, so this is the truth table for a half adder. And um, I'm not gonna show you how to build this. I mean, you're gonna build this yourself. And, and you know, but we know how to turn arbitrary truth tables into, um, into circuits, or we know that can be done. There's lots of different ways you could do it, um, but um, it certainly can be done. So you're going to do that, right? So this is, but this is conceptually what a half adder does. So um, so then the question is, okay, how would we put these together if we want to add numbers with more than one bit? Like let's say we want to add four bit numbers. Um, how would we do that? Um, so one thing we could try, of course, is we'll, we'll just have like a half adder for each column, like for each, you know, bit position. So we'll have a half adder that adds, you know, the last two bits, and then we'll have another half adder that ha adds the next two bits, uh, and so on. Um, the problem is, you know, let, let's try an example here. So if I have like 0, 1, 1, 1, and like, uh, you know, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay? So one plus one, if I put those into my half adder, uh, I'll get, uh, you know, the sum is zero, so that goes down here, and the carry is one, so that goes up here. Okay, but now I'm in trouble, because I have a half adder, another half adder here, but um, like a half adder only takes two inputs, right? And I've got two, I've got three one bits now in this column, like I have the carry, and then I have, you know, the one and the one that were supposed to be added. So I can't just do this by, you know, putting together a bunch of half adders. So what we're going to do, we're going to make something called, right, and probably the name half adder gave it away. We're going to make something called a full adder. Which can add three one bit numbers. Right, because that's in general, we're going to have, you know, when we're adding two things, we'll have a bit from each number and possibly a carry bit as well. So, and, but three will be enough, right? Um, we'll never have more than that. So, how does this work? <clears throat> right, we can make a truth table again. So, A, B, and very conveniently, the word carry starts with the letter C. So, we'll call this C. And then uh, again, we're going to have a carry output and a sum output. Oh, I need to make this a little bit. Uh, okay, there we go. Right, so, uh, okay, I actually need a lot more rows, don't I? Right, so if we have three one bit inputs, then there's two to the third which is eight different possibilities, right? So I can have zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And we could fill this all in, right? So zero plus zero plus zero is zero. This is one. This is also one. One plus one is zero, carry a one. Uh, here we just have one, uh, zero carry a one, zero carry a one, and then finally, in the case where we have three ones, right, we get a sum of one and we carry a one, right? That's three. Um, so 
Uh, of course, we now have a truth table for this, so you could just use the same technique and make a big circuit to do this. Um, however, right again, think about once you've already made a half adder, is there a way that you could use that, uh, reuse a half adder in order to make a full adder? Um, so again, that's you can work that out uh, on your project. But once we have a full adder, right now we can add multi-bit numbers by chaining a bunch of full adders together. Right, so each full adder will do one column of the sum. It'll take a carry bit from the previous one, and um, you know the two the two bits that are input, and then it'll output a sum bit, and then it'll send its carry bit over to the next full adder in the chain. Um, so, you know, also I'll just say uh, a bunch of full adders in a chain and add n bit numbers. All right, and this is called a ripple carry adder. There's other more sophisticated ways to make adders that work a little more efficiently. We're not going to learn about them. Um, this is like the most basic version that works. And I mean, fundamentally, the, the more sophisticated ones are just like variants on this right so they start from this and they're like okay but how can we how can we optimize it a little bit um so really this is the fundamental idea um questions at this point okay again my goal here is to you know obviously there's a lot of details that i'm leaving out because i'm going to give you the joy of discovering the details um, on your project. And that, you know, maybe that sounds um, like I'm being sadistic, but I mean, I, I could say lots of details and you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. And then you'd never remember it. But if you do it yourself on the project, um, you're going to remember it a lot better. Um, but I but I do want to give you kind of like an overview of, of the ideas. Um, and I should say, right, some of you, I think, have already figured this out. Um, and I think I said something about this before, but your book really is excellent. Um, and your book goes into, you know, covers the same kind of stuff that I'm saying, but in different ways, and it goes into more detail about some things. And it even gives you kind of an overview of like, here's the project and here's like the things, here's how you should think about doing the project, right? So um, you really do be want, you do really do want to be looking through your book, um, you know, read through it, at, at least skim the chapter, if not reading it carefully, uh, at least you know kind of what's in there um, and find out and figure out where it is in the chapter that it talks about the project and kind of gives you some some hints um, on how to approach it. Um, definitely recommend that. Um, cool. Right. So this is you know so on your project you'll be making something called an add sixteen, which will be a chip that has like a ripple carry adder that's going to be able to take two sixteen bit numbers as inputs and and output a sixteen bit number that's the sum of those two numbers. Right, and we just saw that that will be able to do addition and subtraction if you like interpret the numbers um, using the twos complement arithmetic. So that's going to be kind of the core of um, how our computer is going to do arithmetic. So um, I'm going to spend the last 20 minutes or so, not quite 20 minutes. We're going to start talking about um, how to make an ALU. So this is like the last part of your project making something called an ALU, um, which is really the heart of um, how our computer is going to do stuff. So let me flip back here. Let's make a new page. So ALU. And this stands for uh, Arithmetic Logic Unit. Um, maybe that's like hyphen or a slash. It's not like an arithmetic type of logic. It's just like it does arithmetic and it does logic. It's the unit that does both of those things. Um, okay, Daniel, with that adder, does A0 represent 2 to the 0 or 2 to the 15? Which would you like it to be? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, a, so it is, it's, it's a good question though, and it is, it can be sometimes a little confusing because usually the way we write binary numbers, we write them like when I say, you know, 1101, one, I start with the highest order bit, like that would be like bit three, and I go down to bit zero. But often, you know, we want to think about bit zero first, 
um, and go that way. So you definitely, it's definitely something you need to think a little carefully about and keep in mind, like which, you know, which bit is this? Um, but uh, but yeah, for sure, it would be really weird if like a zero represented two to the fifteenth. No, like a i always represents two to the i. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. So okay, that's good. I it it looks like. When someone puts a chat thing in there, my computer like flashes a, a, a notification. So even if I'm on a different screen, I'll know that you put a question in the chat. So that is good. So the ALU right is going to be able to do all the kind of like addition, subtraction, also like various logical things that that we're gonna that our computer is gonna provide. Right. Really, the 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 point here is. Um, we're building a computer, and fundamentally, you know, the the computer is going to offer certain kind, types of operations that it knows how to do, and that that you can like write some instructions to say, hey, computer, you know, do this, do this, do this. Um, so you're like, add these numbers, subtract these numbers, you know, uh, take the and of these two things. Um, there's a bunch of different operations that we're going to provide, and we need to build some kind of circuit that can do all those operations. Okay, so the ALU is what's going to um, what's going to allow all those operations to happen. And the way that you're that the book designs the ALU is really cool. Um, and it, it's another instance of, you know, just in the same way that we got a lot of mileage out of addition using two's complement, they're going to get a lot of mileage out of a very simple design that um, will give us you know a lot of flexibility. So um, we're, we're going to start talking about it today, and I think then we'll finish talking about it. Um, on Tuesday, um, but you can also read about it in your book. So, uh, what are the inputs to the ALU? All right, there's actually a bunch. So, there's going to be something called X, which is 16 bits, and Y, which is also 16 bits. So, your ALU is always going to operate on two on two inputs. Um, now, sometimes, like if you just want to take a certain value and flip all the bits, it'll just like it could just like ignore the Y. Um, so there's, there always are two inputs, but sometimes it could ignore one of them um, if that's what you want it to do. But you know, there's there's two inputs there so that you can do things with two operands. Okay, and then there are um, there's six other bits that are inputs. Okay, so there's um, uh, ZX. We're going to call it ZX. Um, and ZY, which are each one bit, right? And ZX says, you know, should we uh, replace X or respectively Y with zero? Okay, so in, in other words, ZX is talking about X and ZY is talking about Y. So when ZX is set to one, it means we should ignore whatever input is coming in for X and replace it with all zeros. That seems like a kind of weird thing to do, um, but we'll see why that can be useful sometimes. Um, and then ZY is the same thing, but for Y, right? So if, Z, if ZY is set to one, then we're going to replace Y with all zeros. If ZY is set to zero, we're going to you know, keep Y as it is. OK. Um, then we have uh, NX and NY which are each one bit, right? And these say, should we, uh, whoops, should we, um, I'm going to carefully say invert X or respectively Y, okay? So if NX is set to one, then we're going to flip all the bits in X. Um, and if NX is set to zero, then we won't do that. We'll just leave it alone. And NY similarly for Y. If N, if NY is set to one, we're going to flip all the bits in Y. And if it's set to zero, we're not going to flip the bits. Um, so, uh, question: What do you think will slash should happen? Like, let's say, let's just think about X. If ZX and NX are both set to one, what do you think should happen? Type something in the chat or unmute, whatever. What, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Nothing? Okay. 
That's one possibility. They kind of cancel each other out somehow. OK, so Simon says X should be all ones. So that would correspond to like if we first uh, replaced X with all zeros and then inverted all the bits in that. So we would invert all the zeros and get all ones. OK, any other possibilities that you think? So what if we uh, first flipped all the bits and then replaced it with zero? What would happen then? Yeah, we just get zero, right? Um, and we could already do that just by saying set it to zero. So that that would be not as useful, right? And in fact, so yeah, so what Simon said is, is in fact what's going to happen. We're going to first do the zeroing or not, and then we're going to do the inverting or not. Um, because the other way around is less useful because there's less kind of possible things that could happen. Um, because if we invert and then zero, we've just lost the effects of the inverting. Um, so we might as well do it second. And in fact, as we'll see, getting being able to get all ones can sometimes be a useful thing. Um, and there's various reasons for that, but um, OK. Uh, there's going to be something called F. So when F is Zero, let me get this right the right way around. Zero means and, and one means add. Okay, so basically F is choosing one of two operations that we're going to do on X and Y. So when F is zero, we're going to take the and of X and Y, like the, you know, bitwise 16 bit and. And uh, when F is one, we're going to add them. OK, so you can you can again, you, you should be imagining like some kind of. Uh, some kind of mux going on here, right? That we're basically we have like we have an and 16 and we also have an, an add 16 and we're kind of choosing which one we're going to use based on the value of F, right? So F will be like the going into the select uh, bit of some kind of mux and, and you'll see actually there's going to be lots of muxes in here, right? So if you weren't sure why you're going to need muxes, well, when you build your ALU, you will you will you will get to use them a lot. OK, uh, and then finally, there's one more input, which is called NO, which is should we invert the output? OK, so whatever comes out of either doing AND or ADD, um, if NO is set to 1, then we're going to take that and, and invert all the bits. If NO is set to zero, then we just we don't do anything. We just leave it as it is. OK. <clears throat> Any questions about this so far, how this is going to work? Or what, what these inputs mean? So uh, in terms of, let's I'll quickly see what the outputs are, and then I want to start doing well, in a few minutes to go through a, a couple examples, and we're gonna we'll keep doing more examples on Tuesday, and you can also read in your book. But um, the outputs, um, well, there's of course like you know out is 16 bits, that represents you know whatever the result of whatever operation that we did on X and Y. Um, and then there's also going to be a couple other outputs. So uh, ZR, which is one bit, mm -hmm. says, you know, is the result zero? OK. Um, and we'll see later why that's going to be a useful thing to know. Um, and then also there's something called, uh, I believe it's called NG. Uh, why can I not write? Okay, that was weird. No, it's uh, you know what? I bet. Okay, I think I know why. I bet you my stylus ran out of batteries or something like that. Uh, now I have to draw with the mouse. Oh, uh, that's awful. All right. So this is one bit. Um. Uh, okay, I'll just say it means is the result negative. 
Okay, that's what it means. And of course, to tell if the result is negative, you can just look at the first bit, right? The first bit tells you whether it's positive or negative. I mean, so in, the, in other words, this ng is the first bit of the output, um, just kind of copied somewhere else, because sometimes that's a useful thing to know. OK. Um, so let's think about. So it turns out I claim that, um, you know, so these the ZX, ZY, NX, NY, F, and NO. So that's six different bits that kind of control what the ALU is going to do. OK. Um, so in theory, that's two to the sixth, which is 64 different possibilities of what the ALU could do. Not all of them are interesting, but a lot of them are. And so the name of the game is to look at different combinations of you know, ZX, ZY, NX, NY, F, and NO, and kind of think about if we set them to like these six values, what would that do overall? Um, and many of them turn out to be useful, nice operations. Um, so for example, um, if we just want it to do and, like I have X and Y and I just want it to do and, that's very easy, right? I just, I don't replace them with zero. I don't invert them. Um, I choose to do and, and I don't invert the output. So if I just make everything zero, um, then it's going to, uh, it's going to take the and of the two inputs. Um, what if we wanted it to do or? Is that possible? So I want, I want to take my X and Y, and I want to find the bitwise 16-bit or of X and Y and output that. Um, any ideas on whether it seems like that's not possible because we've got we all we have is and right. But is there somewhere is there some way that we could use the tools that we have to make it compute an or? Any anyone have any ideas? Okay, so Daniel said not the inputs and then and them, and then not the output. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you remember, um, like maybe you learned about De Morgan's laws and discrete, um, or maybe you've seen this somewhere else, right? So it's in, in general, it's the case that not, I'm gonna type this in the chat here, you know, not of A and B equals uh, not A or not B, okay? So if I if I negate both my so in, and then also I could say not of not a and not b is a or b right so I can say okay set nx and ny both to one so we'll invert both of those inputs then we'll choose to do and and then we'll also choose to invert the output now we've got or okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's think about one more. Well, of course we can do add by we just you know don't don't invert anything, and we just choose add and it'll add. Um, uh, what's something else that we could do? Uh, can anyone think about? Let's say we want to do not on x. So I want to ignore y, and I want to just invert all the bits in x and get that as my output. Can anyone think of a way to do that? So the trick is, right, I mean, we can definitely invert x by setting nx to 1. Mm -hmm. OK, so Zach says, yes. Yeah. So the trick is, how do we get it to ignore y? Because we have to do something with y, and we have to do an operation. We have to do add or and. So Zach says, OK, let's invert x. Let's set y to 0, and then we'll choose to add. OK, so adding 0 doesn't do anything, so that would work, right? Um, there's actually one other way to do it. Can anyone think of what that is? Mm 
Okay, so Zach says we invert x again, and then we set y to one. I think I, I assume you mean set y to all ones, right? Because we can we can set y to zero and then invert it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we set y to zero and then invert that, we get all ones. And if we and, like all ones is an identity for and. So if we and with that, right? Every place there's a one, and we and it with something, right? One and one will leave that other thing as as it was, it'll be one. One and zero will be zero. So, you know, one and whatever is just that whatever. Um, so, anding with all ones doesn't change the thing. So that would work as well. Um, um, <clears throat> anyway, so you might have fun trying to work through. You know, what are some other things? So it turns out, like we can do subtraction. We can add and subtract one from either x or y. We can. Um, there's a couple other things we can do. Um, you might have fun trying to figure out, especially, you know, using that thing where negative X is not X plus one. Um, so we have, we can invert and we can get one and we can add. So that lets us do things with, uh, with negatives. Anyway, we'll probably talk more about this on next Tuesday, but you should have everything you need to get started on the project. All right, so remember project one is due tomorrow. Um, you can get that in or you can ask for an extension if you would like. Um, have a great weekend. See you all on Tuesday.